Dr. Atchison here. We're still talking about Chapter 6, Perceiving Depth, and we were in our second lecture talking about static monocular cues. So as a follow-up, this is what our depth cues are. We've already talked about the ocular motor cues. Now we're talking about the monocular cues, and this is information from only one retinal image. In this lecture, we're going to focus on these static cues here um, that include position-based cues, size-based cues, and lining-based cues. So again, those three main kinds of static monocular cues are cues that give us information about depth based on their position on the retinal image, their size on the retinal image, and the effects of lighting on the retinal image. So again, these are all static, and so this is all going to be just things that aren't moving. That's what static means. And again, the three main categories we have are about position, size, and lighting. Um, so again, um, we're in monocular cues, we're still doing the 2D versus uh, of depictions of 3D scenes, but these are motionless 2D depictions of 3D scenes. We'll talk about dynamic cues, cues that involve movement later. Um, and again, those three main categories are position, size, and lighting on the retinal image. So first, let's talk about position in the retinal image. Um, there's two main ones here. Um, one is partial occlusion, and the other one is relative height. And we'll talk about each of those. And again, this gives us information about depth based on that position in the retinal image. So one of these is partial occlusion, um, or it's also called interposition. Um, and this is, again, one of those position-based cues. And it occurs when one object partially hides another. And it requires this unconscious assumption about how objects are arranged. So when we look at this, it doesn't look like, again, we've talked about this, that this is a red rectangle with a uh, kind of blue um, kind of um, like B shape behind it. No, it looks like the red rectangle is on top of the purple rectangle. Um, and one of the ways that we do this is by these junctions. Um, here they're T junctions, they're T shaped junctions. They'll be different, they're often called different things depending on the shapes um, that we're talking about. Um, but again, it tells us in terms of depth that the red object is closer to us than the purple object because the red object is in front of that. Um, so that gives us again information about that 3D space, even though we're dealing with 2D um, retinal positions. The other one of these is relative height, um, and this allows us to make inferences about the position of objects um, relevant to the horizon or eye level. So kind of where our eye level is, um, it allows us to make um, determinations about um, depth based on the height of the image, the relative height of the image. Um, so it provides information about the relative distance, um, and it's really helpful even if we don't have a floor and a ceiling. So this picture has a floor and a ceiling, um, but we can still see that the relative height of those flowers is almost similar to the relative height of that girl that's standing on the left. So the flowers I know still are smaller just because they look bigger to me. That's because they're closer. So this is where those depth cues come in. Um, and that the mom that's all the way at the end of the kitchen, um, she doesn't, she's about the same size as the daughter, but again, she's further away. So I'm going to infer that actually she's probably taller. And we'll talk about those kinds of size constancy later um, based on that relative height on my retinal image. So let's talk about size in the retinal image now, since we kind of segued into that a little bit. Um, some of this is that size distance relationship. So the farther an object is away from us, the smaller it is on our retinal image. Okay, so in these two trees, um, they're the trees are the exact same size, but they're two distances from the height. And here in this image, we call the first tree is at, dis at D, which is, stands for distance, and the second tree is at 2D, which stands for twice the distance. And if you look at the retinal image, you see H is the kind of the height of the tree, and this one that's further away is half the size because it's twice as far away. So we're able to just kind of divide it by that same difference um, distance, and it changes um, the size on our retinal image. The size on our retinal image then is going to give us information about how far away something is or how close it is. 
The other one we have is visual angle. Um, so the thing that is closer, the tree that is closer, has a larger angle um, on our retina. It's going to take up more space on our retina than the tree that's far away. Um, now in this image, it looks like these things, one would occlude the other. Um, this is the difference between tree one and tree two. You wouldn't look at both trees at the same time because one tree would occlude the other. Um, so the red tree, the closer tree, has a bigger angle um, and has a bigger size on the retina than the blue tree does, the further away tree that has a smaller angle on the retina. Um, and you can see kind of how that crosses. Um, we have a bigger angle for the actual object, which translates to a bigger angle for the actual um, um, retinal image. Same thing with the blue. We see a bigger angle, we have a smaller angle. I mean, we have a smaller angle for one, we have a smaller angle for the other. Another size cue um, is the size distance relation. And there's two different ones that we like to talk about here, one of which is familiar size. Um, and if this is a familiar object, you know from experience about how much space it takes, how big it is. Um, and so if that thing is really far away, um, you, you see, even though it's smaller in terms of what it's experiencing on your retinal image, you know, well, it's still the same size um, and you're familiar with that. And so you can infer depth based on the, the smaller size it has. It lets you gauge distance. Whereas relative size allows you to assume that something um, that looks like they're different sizes on your retina, um, if they're relative, if we really think that they are the same size, it again is allowing us to infer depth and infer de distance. So for familiar size, if you're familiar with what size the golf ball is, which is small, the baseball, which is bigger, and the basketball, which is even bigger, even though all three of these balls are producing the exact same size on your retinal image, because they're familiar, you're going to say, well, that basketball is the furthest away, um, and that baseball is next, and that golf ball is closest even though they're the exact same size on your retinal image because you're familiar with the size of those balls, um, you're going to automatically make this inference about depth. In terms of relative size, I don't necessarily, when you look at this picture, you don't think the person in the back of the line is markedly smaller than the person in the front of the line because you're inferring depth. You really think that they are about the same size. Um, and so we're going to assume depth because of this, because the image, the writer at the back is half the size at the image of the writer at the lead. Um, and we don't really notice this actual size difference as much until we really take those pictures out and hold them next to each other. And we say, oh, wow, there really is a big size difference. We don't necessarily, it doesn't look like that size difference to us because again, we're inferring depth um, based on the relative size of these individuals. And we'll talk about this one a little bit more um, when we get to um, a launch pad activity on illusions. The other thing that we use in size on the retinal image is about texture. So if you look at these different images, the rocks that are very close have a much coarser texture than the rocks that are very far away. And so we're going to infer, again, distance um, because there's a texture difference. Um, the same thing in the sand. Um, there's bigger waves um, in the sand that's close versus the sand that's far, and that's gonna allow us um, to infer that the ones in the back are far away while the ones close up are closer. Same thing with people. You can see the details of those individuals close up, far away you can't. That texture changes from more coarse to more fine grain. And again, this difference between more coarse to kind of fine grain are going to give us information about distance. Linear perspective is one that you're probably most familiar with. Um, this is the idea that parallel lines appear to converge as they recede in depth. Those are really straight lines. They're parallel the entire way, um, but they look like they're converging. They look like they're going to touch um, because of depth. You can see the same thing here with this. The columns, they're much wider at the front than they are at the back. Um, you don't actually think that there's a difference in the size um, of those entries, whether it's the front or the back, because you're inferring depth. Now, we can take these, what we know about linear perspectives, and artists do, and they can use it to trick your depth cue.
So this is an image you can see. When you look at it from one direction, you can see it's convex. Um, but when you look at it straight on, it looks like it's a flat image um, that's drawn. And it's pretty trippy to look at. Um, again, you can see it. Let's do that video again. Um, you can see that these are basically little pyramids with pictures on them that are protruding. But because of the differences um, in linear perspective where things get narrower, he's able to trick your depth perception um, and take something that is, again, outward facing and make it look like it's a 2D image that um, has shown depth. Another one we have is atmospheric perspective. An atmospheric perspective is that the more an air and light must pass through us to reach us, um, can make that light scatter. And so it makes distant things seem further away um, than the no more nearby objects. So in um, the top image, um, because it's kind of a cloudy, misty day, um, you can't really see very good information. It's kind of... Um, um, not as distinct, the mountain scene, as the grass and the field that's close up. The same thing with this canyon picture. Um, because of that scattered light, that atmospheric perspective, um, it's cloudier, that back part of the canyon, versus the canyon that's close up um, appears a lot more distinct. So again, these differences in light scatter um, will really affect our depth perception as well. And this is, an image, this is an issue with lighting in the retinal image as opposed to the size that we've been discussing. Another I issue with lighting in the retinal image is shading. Um, we see that shading as light is falling on a curved surface um, and it creates differences in shading. It gives us information about relative depth and orientation about parts of that surface. And again, this is all happening unconsciously um, and it's interpreting how we're um, looking at depth. So the light is coming from her left side and we see that you can see the depth kind of of her eye socket um, on her right side where that again um, because of that shading we're going to interpret some of that depth whereas her nose um, on the left is very well illuminated um, and not so much on the right that again is going to give us information about depth unconsciously. In the terms of ambiguous shading our idea is that light comes from above because our main light sources come from above. Um, in terms of an, an evolutionary history, the sun's in the sky. Um, and so again, these sorts of perceptual assumptions are that the light is from above. Um, and so in this image, you can't really see any specific form about this. This looks like a meaningless shape um, because your brain is saying, hey, the light is coming from above. Um, and so it doesn't highlight any shapes. However, if you turn this image upside down, um, you're going to interpret it differently because of the differences in shading. So now you can see a deer. Um, again, this image, this issues of lighting in the retina image, shading is very important. Um, and again, that idea that this light is coming from above um, is something that's kind of decided in your perceptual system. Um, and so we can interpret images based on that. And here we can interpret this deer based on this um, idea that the lighting is coming from above. The last thing that we're going to talk about in terms of um, lighting in the retinal image is shadows. Okay, some, some more about shadows. Um, cast shadows um, are information about kind of how big those shadows are being cast on the ground. Um, in this first image, there are no shadows. Um, and so it makes the woman that looks that's running looks like she's further away than the man that's standing. Okay, they look like they're at different distances um, because we don't have any information about shadow. But when we look at image B that does have information about cast shadow, they look like they're at the same distance, um, that she's just above the ground kind of running. Um, and so that relative height was misleading without that image um, about cast shadow. So shadows are another way and lighting is another way that the visual system can take information that's still and static that's, a um, that's from a 3D image and make it into a 2D image. So that ends our lecture on static monocular cues. Thanks.